chapter 7, verse 26, begins the reading. Very disillusioned man again, still speaking with utter honesty. And Well, here's this man's honest experience, and we can't quarrel with ex his experience. What we need to ask is why his experience was so bitter. That's the important question. Verse 26, I found something more bitter than death. Woman, the love she offers you will catch you like a trap or like a net, and her arms round you will hold you like a chain. A man who pleases God can get away, but she will catch the sinner. Yes, said the philosopher, I found this out little by little while I was looking for answers. I have looked for other answers, but have found none. I have found one man in a thousand that I could respect, but not one woman. This is all that I have learnt. God made us plain and simple, but we have made ourselves very complicated. I think that last verse is probably the most profound thing that Ecclesiastes says. God has made us plain and simple, but we have made ourselves very complicated. Only a wise man knows what things really mean. Wisdom makes him smile and makes his frowns disappear. Do what the king says and don't make any rash promises to God. The king can do anything he likes, so depart from his presence. Don't stay in such a dangerous place. The king acts with authority, and no one can challenge what he does. As long as you obey his commands, you are safe, and a wise man knows how and when to do it. There is a right time and a right way to do everything, but we know so little. None of us knows what is going to happen, and there is no one to tell us. No one can keep himself from dying or put off the day of his death. That is a battle we cannot escape. We cannot cheat our way out. I saw all this when I thought about the things that are done in this world, a world where some men have power and others have to suffer under them. Yes, I have seen wicked men buried and in their graves, but on the way back from the cemetery, people praise them in the very city where they did their evil. It is useless. Why do people commit crimes so readily? Because crime is not punished quickly enough. A sinner may commit a hundred crimes and still live. Oh yes, I know what they say. If you obey God, everything will be all right, but it will not go well for the wicked. Their life is like a shadow and they will die young because they do not obey God. But this is nonsense. Look at what happens in the world. Sometimes righteous men get the punishment of the wicked, and wicked men get the reward of the righteous. I say it is useless. So I am convinced that a man should enjoy himself because the only pleasure he has in this life is eating and drinking and enjoying himself. He can at least do this as he labors during the life that God has given him in this world. Here's something I came across in a book. You must face the facts. One day you will die. You are now deciding your destiny. Your life is in your own hands. You can decide to do what you want. You are not the person you want to be. You're not as happy and content as you could be. You are in conflict with yourself. Live your own life and you'll die your own death. Face the facts. There is a God. You can decide to have nothing to do with God. You can live as if Jesus never existed. But face the facts. He did. Christ is alive. You are alive. 
You have to decide what to do with your life now. You can decide to have nothing to do with Jesus and then one day he'll have nothing to do with you. There were some of you not able to sing that hymn, I noticed that. Thank you for being honest and not singing it. But I pray that you will very soon know whom you've believed. Let's pray before we study God's word. Father, from these rather strange words we read, we pray that you will lead us to the fountain of all wisdom, Jesus Christ himself. And as this man honestly groped towards some meaning, some purpose, some point for life, we feel sad for him that he lived before Jesus was born. And we want to thank you that we live in Anno Domini, this year of our Lord, 1976. And we praise you that we can come to better conclusions. But we thank you for all those who honestly try to think and find the answers. Help everyone here tonight to be sure that the answer is Jesus. For his name's sake, amen. One of the things I had to do at Cambridge was study philosophy and I got into a real turmoil doing that and at points came very near to the brink of losing my own faith. When you listen to what men think and the answers they try to give, it really does disturb. I'm very glad I didn't study philosophy at Oxford because in the standard philosophy examination there, one of the main questions is this. How do you know that you are not dreaming? Now that's a philosophical question and you can think that one through for the rest of tonight if you like. You have to give logical, reasonable answers as to why you are convinced that at this very moment you are not dreaming and that you're actually conscious and awake. It's a very difficult thing to prove. As most questions are, when you get down to thinking about them, and indeed many schools of philosophy finish up in a kind of despair, a cynicism, a doubt about almost everything. There was one famous philosopher we were told about who came to one conclusion. There was only one thing he was sure about in life, and he expressed it in Latin, cogito ergo sum, I think, therefore I am. And that was the only thing he was sure about. He was not sure about anything else. I met philosophers who were not sure whether this pulpit was here or not. They had thought so much they couldn't decide what was real and what wasn't. And of course this is the reason why many people do not want to think at all. Indeed if they stopped to think they would be so disturbed, so upset that they just wouldn't be able to face life. And so we live in a world that is designed to help us not to think. You see, if you don't want to think, you better live a very busy life. You better move very quickly through it. And you better have as much noise as possible, because to think you need quiet and you need to be still. You need time. And so when you've got the radio blaring the whole time, you are excused thinking. You can be like the American jumping into his taxi outside St. Pancras Station saying, drive on, drive on, and the taxi driver said, where to? And he said, just drive on, I'm in too much of a hurry to answer your questions. And that, of course, avoids thought. And you can drive through life at that speed, you can rush through this crazy world with all its noise, with all its clamor, with all its mass media telling you what to think, so you can accept the views of the latest newscaster or the latest headline in the tabloid newspaper. You don't need to think, because if you stop to think, you know, there is hardly anything at all that we can be sure of, and that's disturbing. You can't be sure of your job, especially these days, and some of you listening to me now are very worried about your job because you can't be sure of it. There is redundancy coming in your firm. You cannot be sure of your home. You're going to be able to manage 30% increase in rates. You cannot be sure of your children, and some of you are very concerned about your children. You're not sure of them. 
you cannot be sure about your government. Indeed, it's a very narrow line now between the present situation and a general election. You cannot be sure of your future. The way things are heading, you can't be sure of your pension. And when you stop to think and try and make a list of what you can be sure of in this world, it is a very small list. In fact, some would only have to write one word, the only thing I can be sure of is death. And that doesn't cheer you up very much, so let's not think. Let's turn the radio on even louder. And let's rush around. Let's go here and go there. Let's become one of these tourists who just has to see something new, who just has to be on the move, to stop thinking. But this man who wrote the book of Ecclesiastes was willing to sit down and think. And we have explored with him what he thought about money, what he thought about education, what he thought about pleasure, what he thought about wealth, what he thought about wisdom. And we've seen that every one of these explorations of discovery led to a dead end, and he did not discover. Tonight, we come to his exploration into human relationships between men and women, between citizens and the king, between criminals and God. He is exploring all these relationships, trying to find the point, trying to find the meaning, trying to see some kind of purpose in life, and we will explore with him. And I'm afraid he's going to come up with the conclusion, I'm not sure of anything except my Sunday lunch. That's his conclusion, but I'll tell you more about the conclusion when we get to it. Let's first of all look at the social relationships he explores. The first main thing that I notice is that this man is not sure of other people, particularly women. And we have got to ask why. Now, I realize I'm treading on very, very thin ice here. <laughs> and I feel like the Cambridge lecturer who had in his notes at the side, argument weak, shout here. <laughs> But let's look very carefully at what he does say and what he doesn't. Because I want to be absolutely fair to both the men and the women here. Let me say first of all that the gap between his views on men and his views on women is very, very small. His views on women are only fractionally worse. To be precise, 0.1% worse. So that's not a huge difference. It's not enough to get uptight about. 0.1% difference. In other words, he said, I, I've met one man in a thousand that I could respect, but not one woman. But that's only 0.1%. So let's not get too excited about something. Having said that, I will return to what he thinks about men. I think that's in itself a damning indictment that 99.9% .9 of men cannot be respected. That's a strong statement at the heart of it which we need to look at. He was very near to our Lord's outlook here. The Lord Jesus would have said 100%, but he said 99.9%, .9 so he had met someone somewhere whom at least he thought he could respect. But why did he not find one woman well, I'll tell you why, as far as I can see. There are seven reasons, and they explain to me why his different attitude was 0.1% worse. The first thing is that it becomes quite clear from this passage that he had a very unfortunate first experience. And this colored the thinking for the rest of his life. That's always a sad thing. But there is no doubt that your first serious relationship with someone of the opposite sex leaves its mark for the rest of your life, good or bad. And unfortunately for him, the first one was a baddie. And he escaped. He tells us how he escaped from the relationship. He escaped by asking for God's help, and that's the only way a man will escape from that situation. 
He says it's a fate worse than death. We usually talk about a woman in the clutches of a bad man as being in a fate worse than death. But he said a man in the clutches of a bad woman is a fate worse than death. And he said you can get out with God's help. You won't get out with your own help, but you will with God's help. But he did not escape undamaged. That, I think, is the first reason. And it put up a barrier in him for all his later relationships. Secondly, I believe that this man's position, his wealth, his education, all that he had, which he describes in the early chapters, attracted the wrong kind of woman into his life. And so he became disillusioned. I think one of the saddest facts about Paul Getty was precisely that fact that so many women were after him for his money that the one woman who loved him for himself he distrusted only to find out too late that she was fabulously wealthy herself and had loved him for himself. And so because he'd had unfortunate experience he was blind to the real thing when it came. A third reason is that he cast his net far too wide and that comes out in this passage. He said, I discovered this about women little by little by little. Now what does that tell you? He tried and he tried and he tried again. And therefore there is a sad poignancy to his advice in chapter 9, which we'll come to next Sunday night. Be content with the woman you married. Stay with one. Don't try to find as I did the perfect answer one after the other after the other. You know, it's almost pathetic when uh, someone like Burton or Taylor says, you know, this time it's for keeps. The eighth time is really going to be it. <laughs> and you want to take them back to Ecclesiastes and say, you will discover what many have discovered, that you are expecting too much from your partner. And of course, this is the deepest reason why he came to this disillusionment. He was looking not for a person but for an answer. And he calls women answers, which is a thing, not a person. And he was looking for an answer to his own needs, an answer to his own question. And so he wasn't looking for a person to share life with, he was looking for an answer. And he said, I didn't find it. And I became disillusioned. And I think the final reason I would give you why he came to this conclusion was simply that one of the first things that sin spoiled was the relationship between men and women, and this man was a sinner. Now, if you add all those things together, notice he is not making a universal statement. He's not saying you can't trust any woman. What he is saying is, I have found. And it's the sad testimony of Someone who is really saying more about himself than about women here. It is an insight into his character that he has to say sadly, I have found, or rather, I have not found. And I could well believe that among all the women he met, there was one who could have been just right for him, who could have answered his need, had he been in a fit condition to spot her. But for the reasons I've stated, he is saying quite sadly, I found none. None. And of course it was natural for him as a man to hope to find the answer in a woman. But you know, one of the great advantages, if I may jump to one of my conclusions, one of the great advantages of being a Christian partner in marriage is that you do not expect your partner to meet your every need. You know that that is beyond any human being to do. And because you know Jesus Christ, who can meet the deep needs that even your own partner cannot meet, then you do not expect too much of each other, and you can treat each other as people. Now that's the first disillusionment, but let's come back to the men, because the heart of this passage is what he has to say about both men and women. He is saying respect you can hardly find anyone to respect. Now I've told you why he had that 0.1% difference between men and women. But the important thing he's saying is this. God made us all plain, simple people and we have made ourselves complicated. 
and that's the heart of the problem. Now, how did he come to this conclusion? It's a far-reaching one and a beautiful statement. God made me plain and simple, but I have become complicated. That word complicated, do you know the word complex? Who gave you your inferiority complex? The word means complicated. Who gave you your guilt complex? I think every one of us has probably got some kind of a complex locked up in us, which has complicated life for us. And it's made life not a plain, simple thing, but a very complicated thing in which we get all uptight, in which we have wrong reactions to people and situations. Who gave us our complexes? The answer is, he realizes we gave them to ourselves. And like a snowball building up in life, we had a wrong reaction that began to roll and began to pick up other things with it. And gradually what began as a very simple thing became a very complex thing. And I suffer now from a complex that destroys relationships, that prevents me serving the Lord freely, that enters into my uh, dealings with other people in church. And so life becomes so complicated. How did Ecclesiastes come to this conclusion that man originally was a plain, simple creature and that God was not responsible for our complexes? God didn't make us complicated. We made ourselves that way. It is not our fate to have complexes. It is our fault. How did he come to that conclusion? Extraordinarily, he came to it by studying people's faces. And he noticed that when we smile, we have a plain, simple face, and when we frown, we have a very complicated one. Now, what a very profound observation. You know, when you're frowning, you are using 67 facial muscles. When you are smiling, you're using 16. So life is a good deal simpler <laughs> and less hard work. And he says, why is it that some people have plain, simple smiling faces and others have very complicated frowning faces? And he says, I know it's because when you have found the answer, you smile and your face goes simple. But when you're still looking for it, your face is all puckered up and complicated. Now you watch a television quiz show and you'll find that so. A question is asked of the team. <laughs> Their faces go all complicated. But one person's face goes simple. Have you noticed that? And the buzzer is pressed and the face just relaxes. A semi-smile comes and the smile says, I know. <laughs> You're not going to catch me out with that one. And there's a simple reaction. And Ecclesiastes, studying people's faces, had noticed how complicated many faces get and how frown they get. I'm a bit worried because you're all looking at my face. <laughs> well, I'm looking at yours, don't worry. <laughs> but how simple a face becomes when you've found the answer. And so he came to the conclusion that there were so many complexes around and so complicated was life because people ha hadn't found the answer. And I know from this chapter that he was a bachelor. And I know that when he looked into the mirror, he saw a very complicated face a man who'd not found an answer, tried to find a partner and couldn't. So he was complicating himself. He was developing a complex, and that comes through here. I think Sigmund Freud could really go to town with that last paragraph of chapter 7. He says, God made us plain and simple, and so he made us to know the answers to life, and we don't know the answers, and when we fail to find them, we become complex people, complicated people, and life gets hard and tough. And the New Testament has a lovely phrase about the simplicity that is in Christ. And a person who really finds the answer in Jesus Christ becomes a simple person. I don't mean naive, I just mean simple. Simple and straightforward. Now let's move on to the next area of social life that he investigates. In saying he's not sure of people, he's really saying, I'm not sure of myself. And in fact, a man who makes that kind of remark about women is not sure of himself. It's not that he's not sure of women. He's not sure of himself. Now, the second thing, he is not sure of the authorities. 
Now, I can understand this kind of feeling. I've got to confess that I made it my business at school to keep out of the way of the headmaster. And I think some of you may share that uh, complex with me. And when I joined the forces, even though I went in as an officer, that didn't give me self-confidence with the senior officers, and I just kept out of their way. i never forget the ghastly parade, my first parade, when I saluted a man three ranks below me because I didn't recognize his badge and was written off as a greenhorn straight away. But I just kept out of the way of the Air Commodore. We had the senior officer right on our station, and I just kept out of his way. If I got into his way, then I did what I was told and got out of his way as quickly as possible. And some of you have the same attitude to the boss. Keep your nose clean, don't get into trouble, do what you're told, just keep out of the way of those in authority. And Ecclesiastes came to identical conclusions when he thought about his relationship to the king. It's quite clear that he had access to the court, but it's equally clear that he was never quite sure of the mood the king would be in. And so he was unsure of himself in this setting with somebody who had greater power than he had and had greater authority, and he was a little insecure. And so he said, do what the king tells you. But don't stay in his presence. It's a dangerous place to be. Up at college in Cambridge, there was a high table and then a number of low tables. And at the high table, all the tutors and the principal sat. But there was also room for about half a dozen students at the high table, and it was always the last to be filled. I noticed that we all grabbed the low tables, and then the few that couldn't get a place on the low tables found themselves at the high table, poor things. I'm afraid I, I developed a very neat art of getting one of the chairs at the low tables. And so he says, I'm unsure of the authorities, I'm unsure of the king, I'm unsure, so I don't quite know when is the right time to go to him with a petition. I don't know if he's in a good mood that day. And life is really terribly insecure with the persons who are over you. You're never quite sure where you are with them. So do what they tell you, but keep out of their way as much as you can. It's sound advice. It doesn't get you very far. He moves on to another thing he's not sure of. Here's a man just filled with insecurity. And the next thing he's not sure of, he's not sure of the future. And he says, now, no one can tell me what's going to happen next week. And this gives him a feeling of unsureness. Do you know, this is very common. Why is it that so many thousands of our fellow countrymen read first before they read anything else in the newspaper, read their horoscope? Why do they do it? They look straight up to see what their star is and what's going to happen to them. They are so insecure, they want to know what's going to happen during the next 24 hours even. And if they're going to come into a fortune and meet a tall, dark, handsome man, somehow this just gives them a little feeling that life is a little more sure. And so Ecclesiastes says, the one thing I'm not sure about is my life, my future. The one thing I can be certain of is that, is that I can't cheat death. It is going to come. I am going to be in a coffin one day. I just can't cheat death. So that makes him unsure. And then he moves on, and he's writing a list all the time, the things he can't be sure of, and the next thing he can't be sure of, and one of the biggest is, and one of the most disturbing is, I can't be sure of justice. That's an awful insecurity. He gives us three reasons why he can't. Number one, because power is unevenly distributed. And he says there are some people in this world who have the power, there are others who have to suffer under them. And that makes me insecure. And the second reason he gives is that public opinion is so fickle that if you rely on public opinion, you'll find that overnight it can switch to the very opposite of what it was and therefore public justice can fail. And he cites the case of a wicked man who is buried and on the way back from his funeral, everybody's saying what a wonderful man he is. I'll never forget opening Time magazine after Mao Zedong's death. And on the first page was a list of tributes that had flowed in from leaders all over the world. Now this was the man who led the revolution. This was the man who had that incredible power over so many million people that there could be started a most dreadful holocaust in which young people were destroying older people 
And yet as soon as this man died, you should have seen the tributes pouring in from Western leaders. Incredible tributes, the kind of epitaphs that any man would be proud to have. And Ecclesiastes noticed how quickly public opinion changes about people. And it can go the other way too. You can bury a great man and within a very short time people are denigrating his reputation and writing books to prove that he was a rotter. And this is another reason why justice is a thing you can't be sure of. At least never trust public opinion. The third reason, he says, that you can't trust justice is that crime is not punished quickly enough. I think he's put his finger on something vital to our society. With any child, you would know very quickly that if you're going to punish a child, you've got to punish a child quickly. It's no use your mother saying, wait till your dad gets home. The punishment must follow the crime very quickly if it's to deter. And if court cases are piling up and waiting months and months before they get dealt with, by the time they are dealt with, the man's conscience has gone beyond recall and the deterrent has gone. I think the most horrifying example of this observation I found was the first time I saw in Arabia how a thief is dealt with in an Arab country. And that really turned me. A man was caught stealing some fruit or something from a stall in the marketplace and within half an hour they had his right hand off. They simply chopped his hand off in the middle of the marketplace plunged the stump into some pitch to cauterize it, and that was it. And the result? You can leave your suitcase anywhere in the desert in Arabia and go back three weeks later for it. Crime is dealt with immediately. And Ecclesiastes says, if crime were dealt with as soon as it took place, it would stop. And that's a profound observation because he applies it not only to human retribution but he says, God, why don't you deal with sin as soon as it arises? Why don't you make this a moral world in which as soon as a man sinned he's punished and then that would stop sin? We can't even rely on your justice, Lord. And here Ecclesiastes fights against what he was taught in the Sunday school as a Jewish boy or the Sabbath school as it would be then. He was taught, if you obey God and do what's right, you will be rewarded. If you disobey God, you will die young. And that was the simple equation between sin and suffering that his Jewish teachers had given him. It's a simple equation that many people assume, that if you are good, it pays, and if you are bad, you will be punished, and therefore it pays to be good. Honesty is the best policy, etc., etc. And it is nonsense, says Ecclesiastes. If you look at life, you will see that it is immoral. You will see that the righteous often get the punishment due to the wicked, and the wicked often get the reward due to the righteous. God, why don't you punish immediately? Why don't you put it right immediately? It would stop sin if you punished it as soon as a person did it. Why then do you let this go on like this, even right to death, so that nobody can see your moral principles working out in this life? And I'm afraid that's one of the biggest questions that you ask when you're honest about life. Why does God wait before punishing sin? Why does he wait so long that people's consciences are deadened and they forget about the sins they've committed? Why does he not teach them a lesson now? so that they might learn? It's a big question. But he's saying, God, I'm not even sure about you. I'm not even sure that you reward goodness and punish badness, because I don't see you doing it. And so having made his list, I'm not sure of people, particularly in his case, women. I'm not sure of myself. I've made myself so complicated. I'm not sure of the king. I'm not sure of my future. I'm not sure of human justice. I'm not even sure of divine justice. He says, well, then what can I be sure of? And there's only one thing. And he says, the only thing I can be sure of are the simple pleasures that I can enjoy by myself. I find this sad. He's saying, I can't be sure of anyone else. The only thing I am sure of is when I'm enjoying myself. 
And so in modern terms he would say, the best thing a man can do on this Sunday is to have a good Sunday lunch with roast beef and Yorkshire pudding, go down to the pub for a drink afterwards, come home and watch the telly. That's what he's saying. That's the best advice I can give. He says, you can't be sure of anything or anyone else, so you can be sure that you've enjoyed your Sunday lunch. You can be sure that you're enjoying the telly, so you get on with it and enjoy yourself. Is that all you can say to us, Ecclesiastes? Is that all? That's not much. And once again, we realize so clearly that if your limits to human wisdom are what you can discover under the sun and before you die, then that is the philosophy you are left with. And it is the philosophy of probably three quarters of our fellow countrymen today who will have a good Sunday lunch and go to the pub for a drink and come home and watch telly. And that is the purpose of life. And that's the point of life. And that's as far as they can get. And it's the one thing they're sure of. They're not sure of their job, their home, their pension, their future, anything else. But they are sure I've had a good lunch and I've had a good pint of beer, and this is a good program on the telly, and I'm enjoying it. But do you see what a, a self-centered philosophy it is? Having said you can't respect or trust others, Ecclesiastes has to say the only thing is to enjoy yourself. And that's why it is understandable that so many of our fellow countrymen live as they live. It is the logical conclusion. They have come to it instinctively and immediately, whereas Ecclesiastes went halfway around the world to find it out. He explored it with his mind, he thought about it, he tried it, he explored as far as he could, and he came back to where most people are anyway, and said, that's all you can do. And I just find it extremely poignant that men and women who were made in the image of God who were made with eternity in their minds, as Ecclesiastes says, who were made for God, who were made for something much bigger than this world, who were made to rise above the sun, who were made for heaven itself, have come to the conclusion that the best thing you can do is have a Sunday lunch and a pint at the pub and watch telly. But you can understand it. And so, as usual on these Sunday evenings, I finish by telling you the good news. If there is no security, finally, in loving women, if there is no security, finally, in obeying authority, if there is no security, finally, in even doing what you believe God wants you to do in this world, I tell you there is security in Jesus Christ. And when I turn to the teaching of Jesus, I find that he said many of the things that Ecclesiastes said. His observation on life was just as keen and keener. But he came to totally different conclusions. It's fascinating that Jesus had an even lower respect for human beings than Ecclesiastes. Because he said 100% of men. He didn't say 99.9%. .9. One of the most startling statements made of Jesus is made in John's Gospel at the end of chapter 2 where it says, Many put their trust in Jesus, but he would not put his trust in any of them because he knew what was in man. What a statement. And yet he didn't despair. And he didn't shut up himself and say, I'm going to enjoy my Sunday lunch. That's all I can do because I can't trust people. He was so sure of himself that he was able to give himself to those who trusted him. Even though he knew them through and through. Even though he was under no illusions about human nature. Even though he knew about the complexes. Even though he knew how complicated they'd made their lives. A Mary Magdalene could come to him with such a complicated life. She was mixed up with men, with demons. Oh, she was so complicated when she met Jesus. And Jesus didn't say, this is a wonderful woman underneath. No, Jesus knew that he was a wonderful savior. He trusted his own power to straighten out that woman's life so she became a simple woman. She lost a complex. She loved Jesus, and his love for her created in her the simplicity that was the secret of life. 
And this mad woman became one of the loveliest women you can imagine. And Zacchaeus was a man who'd got all his accounts very complicated, and my, how he fiddled them, only he knew. And his relationships were all complicated. And he was a man of such complexes that uh, people wouldn't let him through to the front of the crowd. He was a little man, and little men often have a complex. And so he climbed up a tree, and he got up a tree, and, and Jesus said, Zacchaeus, come down. We're going to get your life straightened out today. Let's, let's get you back to being a plain, simple person. And dear Zacchaeus said, look, if I've been wronging people, I'll get them repaid. I want to get things straight and simple, get my book simple. And Jesus was just going through life. He didn't trust any man because he knew what was in man. But he trusted in himself because he trusted in his Father. And that made his life very simple. Because when you look at the life of Jesus, you see essentially a very simple life. A life untrammeled and uncomplicated. A life, for example, that had perfect relationships with women because he was not looking for an answer in them. He was looking for people. He was not trying to meet his own need. He was trying to meet theirs. And you find, therefore, that in every situation he met it so simply with utter confidence you couldn't find in Jesus any trace of a complex. You try. Get the best psychiatrist you know to go through the life of Jesus and find a complex. No, his life was simple. If the wind and the waves were threatening his disciples, he just stood up and said, Peace, be still. How simple. And in a situation where the disciples were tearing their hair because they couldn't help someone and were getting all uptight, Jesus said, oh, how long am I going to be with you? Bring him to me. Bring him to me. Quite simply, he dealt with it. And here was a person who was sure of God and who could say before he did a miracle, thank you, God, that you heard me. Here was someone who had this absolute trust in God so that he could relate to people, men and women. He could relate to those in authority. He knew the wisdom of getting out of the authorities' way. That's why he was often crossing the Sea of Galilee in a boat. If you study a map, you'll find that even though the Sea of Galilee is a tiny lake, there were three different territories sharing the shore of the Sea of Galilee. And when Jesus got into a boat to cross the lake, it was simply to get out of the way of an authority, Herod or someone else. He knew the wisdom of when to put himself in the hands of the authorities, when to keep out of their hands. And yet there came a day when he chose to die. And to me this is perhaps the most wonderfully simple thing about Jesus, that he knew when it was right to die, and he decided when it would be, where it would be, how it would be. You don't need to pity Jesus as he goes to the cross, he has chosen this. He is not the victim, he is the victor. He is not being trapped by circumstances. He is in charge of those circumstances. No man takes his life from, them, from him. He lays it down of his own free will. What a simplicity there is. And it's when people come to know Jesus Christ, which is something the writer of Ecclesiastes was not in a position to do, alas, but we who live in Anno Domini can come to know Jesus Christ. And the things that happen then are that we then gain the confidence, the assurance to relate to people. We then gain the confidence to face our death. We then gain certain assurances which make us people not with a long list of things we're not sure about, but with a long list of things we are sure about. And at last when I listen to Jesus, I understand why God does not punish sin immediately. Why life seems to be so immoral. He said, it's very simple really. You see, God is letting the wheat and the tares grow up together. He's not pulling the tares out as soon as they appear. Because if he pulled the tares out, there'd be nothing left to grow. You'd pull the young wheat out also. And so he's letting both grow together. But one day, 
he will separate them and the wheat will be gathered into his barn and the tares will be burned. What a simple answer to the question. That if God rooted out of our society every person who sinned as soon as they sinned, just ask yourself, would anything be left? Would any one be left to grow and be harvested? The answer is not one person. And God intends to have a harvest. And so he lets good and evil go on growing together. He lets evil people get away with it. But let them be absolutely sure of this. For Jesus was absolutely sure. And it comes out in parable after parable. Whatever a man sows, that shall he also reap. Story after story, which Jesus told, said, The wheat and the tares grow together. The wise and the foolish virgins wait together. The good and the bad fish are caught in the net together. Yes, it's all mixed up together. But one day, there'll be a separation of wheat and tares of good and bad fish, of wise and foolish vir virgins. One day the wrongs will be put right. One day God will act. And how wise he is to be patient with us. We should see the apparent injustice of our world as a glorious token of God's patience with us in letting good and evil grow together that some of us might be gathered into his barn. What mercy! What patience. And so in Jesus Christ I become sure of judgment. I become sure that this is a moral universe. I become sure that rights will be put right and rights will be rewarded and wrongs will be punished because Jesus said, I'm going to put it right. All the nations will be gathered together before me, the Son of Man. And in Jesus Christ I become sure of my future. I no longer need to say, I don't know where I'm going when I die. I hear a voice say, I am the way. I'm the way. And I become sure. If I may repeat what I said this morning at the end of the service, there are many things that a Christian is not sure about. Many, many things, and we need to admit them honestly and freely. And there are questions that some of you ask me that I can't answer. I do not know what some things. I do not know when some things. I do not know why some things. I do not know how some things. But the one thing I do know is who. And that brings me the assurance I need. You've just sung it. I know not why. I know not how. I know not what of good or ill. But I know whom I have believed. And that's why Ecclesiastes could never sing the hymn we're going to sing in a moment. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. He wasn't sure of anything except when he was enjoying himself. But when you're sure of Jesus, you're sure of everything worth having. You're sure that judgment is coming. You're sure that your sins can be forgiven. You're sure that heaven is being prepared for you. You're sure of Jesus. Not sure of yourself, but sure of him. And so thank you, Ecclesiastes, for reminding us how little we can be sure of in this world. But thank you, Jesus, for making us sure, so sure of the next world that we can say with Paul, I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus. If you're sure of that, you can sit lightly to all these other things. And if you're sure of that, you will not expect too much of your wife or husband you will be able to treat them as a person. If you're sure of this, you will not be afraid of any authorities because with Jesus and Pontius Pilate, you can say to the highest authority in the land, you would have no power over me unless it were given you from above. And if you're sure of Jesus, you're sure that crime does not pay and sin does not pay and that the accounts will be settled and so with Jesus comes the security we need.
to live simple lives, uncomplicated, without complexes. Plain and simple folk we may be, but thank God for making us that. Let's pray. strikes me so clearly that God has not called many wise, many noble, many high because simple people can see it better and God wants a family of simple, plain people whose security lies in his love who can face anything because they are quite sure that nothing can separate them Oh God our Heavenly Father Make us sure of the most important things. In a world in which we become less sure of most other things, help us to know whom we have believed and to be persuaded that he is able to keep what we've put in his hands until the day when everything else disappears and only you are left. Lord, thank you for the security of knowing that none shall pluck us out of his hand. Thank you for the life assurance policy that Jesus gives us. Thank you that we can face the uncertainties even of this coming week without fear, but with the love that casts out fear, a love that you have for us and have put within us through your Holy Spirit. And so, Lord, I pray very personally that if anyone here is afraid of something, if anyone here is suffering from an insecurity of any kind in their personal relationships, in their plans for the future, Lord Jesus, will you step right into that insecurity? Will you just say to them, I'm here. It's going to be all right. And to you we shall give all that glory for your name's sake. Amen. Blessed assurance, blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. 493. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine, heir of salvation purchase of God, born of his spirit, washed in his blood. 493. When we get to the chorus, the second time we sing, this is my story, let's slow up and let's really emphasize it. But please don't sing this hymn if it isn't your story, if it's not your song, if you're not sure. And if you can't sing this hymn for very honest reasons, and you would like to talk to any one of us before you go home, we should be so glad to do so. There's Philip Vogel. Put your hand up, Philip, right where you are. If you'd like to just go and see him afterwards, he'll tell you how you can be sure. And God does want above all things, he wants his children to be sure that he loves them and that they belong to him. So go to Philip or have a word with me at the door. Blessed assurance, let's stand and sing. Thank you.